Greetings and salutations, race fans, motorsport lovers, and lovers of things classic, things oldish, things from a bygone era that make our heart pump a little bit faster. And welcome to George Fisher, a sports car legend, a motor star legend, a man who's larger than life. And George Fisher joins us today. Georgie, thank you very much for taking time out this morning to, to have a chat with us. And welcome to RaceDay.TV. No, thank you, Colin. Uh, yeah, it's been great watching you guys for the last uh, year or two, and wonderful job. Ple uh, pleasure to be here. It's absolutely marvelous seeing. But now, these days, you're a pilot, more than a, an airplane pilot, more than a race car pilot. And Fritz, let's put that uh, first picture up again. The, you and Sonia, you do quite <laughs> a lot of flying around and where do you fly from and and why um it's 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 a hobby it's it's certain innovation uh we fly out of uh, rhino park and where we just decide uh, at the moment where to fly you know if the weather's good you just grab a plane and toss into wherever you know it's 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 just a casual thing and we land and we get together with a few friends and have a bar and a couple of beers and yeah it's just a, it's a social thing i suppose being active in motorsport for so many years uh, you know you, you need that adrenaline and it's just a different type of adrenaline and you've flown uh, so i'm sitting in a, a race car simulator and we'll talk a little bit about your experience and, and other older people um and i'm not accusing you of being old other um, people beyond the age of 50 uh, and the experience of simulators, but you fly um, airplane simulators as well and proper airplane simulators. And what is your impression of them and how cool are they? Look, I mean, that, uh, that's just a fantastic opportunity. I've, I've had to fly 737 simulators and Airbus simulators. I mean, they are proper. They, you know, you, you will not tell the difference between that and the real thing. In fact, you, you can get pretty airsick in them if you, you're an airsick uh, type person. So, yeah, th but it, it was just opportunities that I got to do them and uh, not, nothing else. I'm, I'm certainly not thinking of uh, training on them or becoming a professional pilot. But, yeah, it's, it's just part of the fun that uh, I'm having at the moment, you know. We, we're not getting any younger, so trying to enjoy life as much as possible. As you certainly talk about enjoying life. You seem to have had a, how shall we put it, a colorful life. You've raced powerboats, SAS cars, champion in, in uh, Formula One powerboats in South Africa, SAS car champions, and I've got to read this here, West Bank V8 champion, Formula Atlantics, Group One, Group N, Formula Ford, rallies, and sports cars and in particular in sports cars you are a little bit of a Lamar specialist 14 times Lamar uh, 1984 to 1987 and I think we've got your first Lamar car and I want to go to that there's no, that was your the first car 17 years old you raced that at Kyle Army at Kramer what was that like at 17 having driven some group N and production cars jumping into that beast well, there's a funny story behind that. You know, I, I went out in a, a couple of laps in, in the car and I remember thinking to myself, well, this is, this is not so brutal. You know, everyone says, be careful, the power and all this. What I didn't understand is it had, on the throttle, you had two spring settings. One was a spring setting before the turbos kicked in and one you had to push harder on the throttle to get through to this, the second spring setting. And, and obviously I thought, well, you know, I was, I was flat on, on, on the floorboard. And coming out of the second S, for some reason, I, I pressed a bit harder, which then put me through the second spring setting, which is when the turbos kicked in. And from the S's up to Lukov, I, I really crapped myself. I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, is, this is pretty different to what I expect. And, uh, yeah, you know, from three, I'm tossing around the 300 horsepower, I think we went up to about 650, 700, whatever the horsepower was in the car. But, yeah, it, it, it taught me respect and speed. It, I mean, it was, a, it was a flat bottom car, it wasn't a ground effect mm -hmm. car. So I think we ran at Kyle Army. We were the quickest down the straight 
at about 320, 325, somewhere around there. So it, it certainly hauled down uh, the old Kyle Army straight. But yeah, it, it, if I think back, it probably was one of the most dangerous cars I've ever driven. It was uh, <laughs> uh, it was a space ram, a uh, space ram car, and <laughs> but yeah, great experience. And then uh, you also that year you you were driving Atlantics, um, formerly Atlantics um, as well. But before we get there, let's just go back to six years old. You drive a track a bulldozer. Then at eight, you driving a, a, a bulldozer and or a tractor, and you fall off, and that's how you you got the the scar on your head. What actually really happened there? Well. I was teaching one of the, the farm workers to, to drive a tractor and I was sitting on the mud guard of it and we hit a bump and I slipped off in front of the back wheel and, and if you look at the scar it's exactly the tread of uh, uh, a track, uh, tractor tyre. You kind of wear it with a little bit of pride. Well, nothing I can, <laughs> nothing I can do about it, I suppose. You know. Now, you know, let's, it, it, let's just jump ahead, and and I, I don't. I mean, this is not. I don't. There's so many different things that that come to mind, and cars that you've run. You've run um, some rally cars, and uh, Pit Vestra tells us a lovely story of uh, you in PE, <laughs> and um, and an Opel Ascona. Uh, tell us what happened with the Opel Ascona that you were testing with Pitt. Man, it, it was a brand new car that they had just put together. And uh, Bernie Mariner then had employed me as, uh, as the group and driver as well as giving me the opportunity in the rally car. And we, he said, well, take it out. Let's go and test the, the car. And... We had a run, I can't remember where it was, somewhere out in the Hague area. Uh, down the hill, some fast sweeps, and coming back, I, I came over this blind rise in fifth gear, but uh, for some reason I'd forgotten there was a 90 right. <laughs> when I saw this, I, I knew straight, straight away we were in deep trouble. Tried to slow the car down by putting it in the sideways drift and I thought we were right for a while I thought okay it's going to work out but on the side of the road where they dozed the road it had these embankments and it then got it hit the embankments got airborne still stayed four wheels down and I thought no we, we're going to be good here but unfortunately they had cut a few trees down and the rear axle or the rear wheel hit one of these stumps which tore out the rear axle and then obviously just put us into a cartwheel. No helmets. I, I'd, I'd had a few rolls in my life, so I, I understood it, but poor Pete, uh, which I certainly, he, he, he never drank before in his life, so I'm, I'm sure he became an alcoholic <laughs> after that. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, but, um, you know, we stopped rolling, and, and the only thing that I'd lost off my head was my dark glasses. So, you know, I just asked. First of all, he was shouting, where's the bloody cutoff switch? That I do remember, yeah. Where's the bloody cutoff switch? And I said, well, I don't know. You bought the bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> you should know. He was in a total panic. I just wanted my dark glasses. But I think, I think the biggest fear was getting back to the workshop, because and, all the mechanics were at the scene. Yeah, and, 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 and explaining and facing Bernie. Facing Bernie. Exactly. So, and uh, so we, we, creep, we creep back into the workshop and dead silence. I just hear this from the office. All you guys in here. Walk past the secretary and she's got this little smug smile on her face. That you guys are in deep, you know what. And, and the first words that came out of Bernie's mouth was, uh, is anyone injured? And we all stood there like little boys saying, no. I said, well, what are you standing around here? Get back to work and build another car. George, you stay here. And he said, you can tell me over lunch what happened. And over lunch, I asked him, well, Bernie, how did you know that we destroyed the car? Said, I've been in this bloody business long enough to know when a car arrives back here without, or when a, when a bunch of mechanics arrive back here and I don't hear any race cars in the background, 
I know they should. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, he, he was a, he, he was a great team manager in that respect, and you know, Bernie it was, was great working for him. A proper a man larger than life. Who you know, when he strutted around with his or marched around with his briefcase, you knew that he's Bernie knew the rules and he knew how to play motorsport. Oh yeah. And he, and he respected people who were straightforward and honest with him, and uh, he took no bullshit from anybody as well. Great guy. No, absolutely. Com complete uh, legend. Uh, probably, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now you've had, uh, just talking about crashes, um, 1992, uh, in, in a 9, Porsche 9, was it a, a 962? And you had a, a tire go with a massive, massive crash that injured you quite badly. Talk us through that, that whole crash. Um, no, the big one was in a Toyota. Oh, okay. In cool, Japan. Yeah. Is yeah. that the one you... Yeah, it was yeah, big that in was Japan. 92. Yeah, that was... That was yeah. Uh, yeah, that, um, that was in qualifying. What had happened is the... Um, the tie manufacturer and the rim manufacturers had a bit of a debate, and I, I don't know what the issue was, but one of the sizes was wrong for the qualifying tie. Now, those days, a quality tie would last one lap, so they, they, they'd be sticky as hell. Mm. And it was at Fuji coming onto the straight, which was the fourth gear, flat out, 300 km an hour corner, and the tire separated from the rim. Unfortunately, it's not a corner where anything happens, being being flat out. Yeah. There's there, hardly any accidents happen there. And and so there was just a concrete wall there. But of course, losing the front wheel, it, it just went straight. Telemetry told that the impact speed was 288 kilometers an hour. When 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 the tire went, I, I knew this was going to be a big one. And yeah. from when the tire went to the impact was 0.7 of a second. But I, I tell you, it lasted for hours in my brain. It was like this is going to, and I, and I did use the F word a few times in that 0.7 of a second. This is going to be an F big one. Yeah. And I think it it tumbled six seven times. And the last tumble, I remember seeing this guy and thinking, oh, I just hope it's got the energy to fall back on whatever's left. But yeah. we'll we'll wait, we'll side down, yeah. which it didn't. It, it it ended up on his roof. And in the mirror, I looked. There's one mirror left, and here was this fluid. Now, automatically in your brain, you think, shit. Now we we got petrol flowing here, and I'm trapped because my door is this side of the ground down. But I looked this side of the car, and there's nothing left. So I basically just stepped out. With the adrenaline, I, I walked away from it. Heinz Harold Frenson actually stopped and helped me. And I thought, well, shit, I, I walked away from it, not knowing that my, my feet were pretty well banged up. And two, three hours later, you know, when the adrenaline wore off, all of a sudden I couldn't walk anymore. You know? So, yeah, it banged me up pretty bad and concussion for three months. And, but there was seven months that you spent on crutches as well in the end of the 92 season. Correct. Well, the problem is it, it crushed, it palpitated the bones. It didn't break the bones. It, you know, it, it made them into, for a lack of a better word, a powder. Yeah. I mean, your feet you know, were pretty I far forward wrong. in those cars. And, and you, you basically had no chance. Any frontal impact in the early days of, the, of those cars, <clears> I mean, they're, they're aluminium. They weren't super strong like no, some the, of the cars. No, Toyota, Toyota was carbon. If, if, if it was a Porsche, I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. It was a carbon car, and, and, but, you know, even so, it's, uh, there, were, there were pieces of grass between my sole and my foot. I mean, how they got in there, I don't know. Because trying to pull the grass out of my shoes, it, they just broke. So, so. But let's go back to but, yeah, ha it, it, happier it, times. It, it. You know, <laughs> we had to get some of these wild, wild things, um, and and some of the uh, you're alive despite some of the things that um, that have happened. And you, you drove 14 times Le Mans. That's actually blooming special. 
I, I realize it now. At the time, it was part of my job, you know. I, I was very fortunate to to be employed as a, as a driver. And, you know, it's the right place, right time. And so I didn't realize it then, but Lamar was just part of my contract. Uh, and, yeah, amazing, amazing races. Uh, atmosphere, you, you could never take that away. But if if I look back, yeah, shit, lucky boy I was. And the times that you did Lamar, that was still when Mulzahn was uh, without chicane, and you spent many many minutes flat out in a nine three six and then a nine six two um, down Mulzahn. That must have been a bit of an eye opener. Uh, Mulzahn was uh, it's a wicked <laughs> wicked thing. Uh, at night in the rain, following other cars, it can, it, it gets your attention. And you know, it's, it's part of history. I, I've, I've done Lamar with three configurations, you know, the, the Dunlop chicane coming up the hill past the pits, that, that used to be a flat, uh, flat section, then they put the chicane in there, then they put the two chicanes in down the mills on. But, it, you know, it's still a dangerous place. It doesn't matter how you look at it. You know. and, uh, from Bef what's, Before what, Indianapolis, you still... What's your fondest memory of... What's your fondest memory of Lamar? Hell, I, I don't know. <laughs> they, they, there's no special one. I mean, each, each one has its own occasions being at fun times being at sad times it, it, it can be a very emotional race uh, I think in 1990 we did 23 and a half hours and broke a, a dry shaft uh, so yeah. yeah that was a bit, a bit sad you know to be half an hour from the end yeah and not finish and and it was uh, two drivers we opted just to do it with two drivers that year so we, we were pretty knackered uh, and then uh, winning class win in ninety four. Yeah. That uh, that was a good party afterwards. Uh, Although they, they, we could have won it overall. That was with uh, Stephen Watson and Hilton Cowie. In a blooming Lotus. No, no, no hold on. No, no that year ninety four. That was no, no, uh, that, that, broke the engine. That was uh, Daytona twenty four hour. Jeez, my research department needs a kick up their ass. They haven't done their job properly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, un unbelievable. Um, now Hilton you... and, and uh, Stephen, we did Daytona 24 hour. We we broke down at 10 o'clock the following day, the Sunday morning. And that, that, that was, was in a Lotus Esprit okay. or Esprit. That yeah, that was. But George, you. Again, and I've got to go back to my research guy here who's sitting over, over here, the research guy who didn't um, do his job so, so well. Um, you, but you competed in Japan a lot, 26 times Fuji. You became a little bit of a legend uh, in Japan. Uh, how did that come about that you went to race in Japan? Uh, it was after a race at Spa. I'd basically run out of options, and this was 1985, out of options to drive in Europe, and I bumped into a guy by the name of Alan Chupin, which uh, is Lamar legend as well, and, and we, I bumped into him at a pub, and I, we just got chatting over a few beers, and he, he told me about Japan, he said, well, you keen to come over there, I, I can arrange your test, but uh, if you do get the drive, uh, you know, I need a bit of commission on the side, and so buggered off to Japan. Uh, I remember Hans Stuck was also uh, there looking for at the same seat, and so for me to get the seat over him was, I mean, shit, yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. Mind blank. And that was in this car, yeah, and, the, the uh, trust port. That, that that's correct, yeah. And uh, yeah, then signed on for I think two races towards the end of '85. And then they offered me a contract for 86, and that's how that relationship started. And uh, you spent a, a lot of time there, but you've had a, you had a narrow escape from Japan eventually. 
where you had to leave in a bit of a hurry. Uh, in what sense? I'm told that there was a time when uh, at the end of a race, or was it in Japan um, or was it in Europe where you needed to get out of the country rather rather uh, rapidly? Yes, yes. That was, I was actually taken to the taken to the airport and put on a plane. Uh, that was Hungary, yeah. where I went in with a passport that uh, wasn't South African to do uh, as, as one did. race there. Yeah, as we did. And just after qualifying, and I, I had I had the car on pole. It was part of the European uh, Sports Car Championship. And just after qualifying, uh, customs and immigration arrived there and said we had to deport you. So we negotiated a 24-hour, uh, I um, can't, can't remember what, what the, the wording was for what it was, but a, a, a for 24 delay, hours I could a delay, yeah. <laughs> a delay, yes. And, and they meant it 24 hours, so uh, did the race, won the race. Got on the podium, sprayed the champagne, and you know those days that was still that side of the Iron Curtain. So we had a crowd of 115,000 people, which you know was, they 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 had no sport over that side of the world, and and a motor race for them was just something was just a, an experience of unbelievableness to them. But in any case, sprayed the champagne, climbed down from the podium. They took me, put me in a police car. I got dressed from there on the way to the airport from my, my race overalls into my civvies. Yeah, and three hours later, I was sitting in my apartment in Cologne, just wondering what the hell just happened to me, you know, from this this extreme high that I was on to sitting there going, shit, what, what just happened? So, yeah, that's that story. And then uh, you, you, you drove a lot for... Porsche in Japan, and then transition to Toyota. How did that come about? And I mean, th this was at the group, the height of Group C, and sports car racing was proper. There were big engine wars, manufacturer wars, and tire wars in Japan. They were, and the problem was the Porsche 962 was getting a bit old in its, uh, you know, they, they stopped development. Uh, where Nissan, Toyota, Mazda, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Jag were coming with new, newish technology, being at carbon tubs, carbon brakes, and and Porsche were just falling behind in in the whole, the whole deal, and and there was quite a few offers bouncing around my table, which you know was was great. I mean, Mazda had a, a wonderful offer for me, but financially it was wonderful. But they just weren't competitive, so I had to make a decision: uh, Do I go for huge money <laughs> or half money and, and go to Toyota? But I mean, the budgets were were just ridiculous between Toyota and uh, Nissan. Uh, I think our budget for the two cars was 125 million dollars for this for the season. And, and you must understand that in qualifying, I mean, we just had eight eight motors to go and blow up. They would just sit there. And they had mega, mega power and, and, as well. What sort of power well, did the they have? Toyota, Toyota in qualifying would run 1400 plus. And what's that like when, that you, one lap. When, so, when you light it up and you've got 1400 horses kicking you up the ass with lots of grip? Well, I, I think the first time you, you experience it, you, you, you feel a bit out of this world. I, I suppose it's like taking off in a, a shuttle. You know, it's like, this is just, it's ridiculous, it just can't, it can't carry on like this. And it doesn't, because the engines are built for one lap. They literally, I've seen them blow up on the line as they go over the line. Nissan was pretty famous for that, as they crossed the line. And those days we had two qualifying sessions, so basically it was two laps that you could, you could do to get pole. Pole was very important in Japan, from a PR point of view. Yeah. In fact, I think it was more important than actually winning that race. So, so there was a big fight. Yeah, sorry. 
there was a big fight to see, you know, who could get on pole, and that, that fight was always between us and them Toyota. And also with the um, Yokohama and Dunlop, the tyre manufacturers. So you've got engine wars, chassis war, or engine and chassis wars, um, as well as tyre wars. It must have been really exciting times when the team sort of gets you prepped up and sends you out for this one lap, you know, M&M. &M. You've got one shot and give it all that you've got. Mm. It takes a special mindset to actually deliver on that one shot um, that you get. Your, your mind is in a different world. It is, I mean, it's totally, totally focused. What what they would do is, is give you a set of qualities, send you out and maybe 1,200 horsepower, just, just to, to put just that mindset. Yeah, you know, and then, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd understand the tires. You'd come in, they'd dump a, a brand new set of tires up, pump you up to 1,400 plus and say, right, there you go, no traffic, bang in the best you can, and but yeah, you, you live in for the, for that moment in time, you live in a different world, totally. It's uh, it's it's hold your breath for whatever the lap time is, you know, minute and a half, you hold your breath. It's, and, and you, you uh, some you come over the line and you you start, it's like coming out of water. You, jeez, that was that wasn't that was good. <laughs> And in, in those laps, just to go back, if you can just think back in, particularly on some of the fast marginal corners where, how much do you, you can't react because there isn't, isn't time to react uh, very often, but do you put the absolute trust in the downforce, the grip of the tire and pin it and hang on? You chance it. You, you, you do chance it. You, you know, you, you. But 99% of the time, you, you get away with it. Uh, it's it's mind boggling to understand what. You know, a qualifying tire from a race tire is, is three to four seconds. And, and you, you pretty much pick that up in the first corner. You understand the grip. Uh, and then, and then just but go yeah, for it. But yeah, it's uh, just go for it. Yeah, you, it does step out of line now and then, but uh, besides the one big shunt, which uh, was a tire come off the rim, uh, we, we did pretty good. We did all right. <laughs> George, you did, a, did more than just a right. I think you did bloody well. Before we, we wrap up, there are a couple of things that, um, two real re things I want to talk about. Um, Eddie Jordan and testing for the Jordan Formula One team and then I want to talk about the the Alpha GTV sixes that you ran in group one It's just mega mega memories. So 1983 you get this opportunity to go and test in a Jordan from a Sassel Jordan Formula One car How did that come about mm -hmm. and, and talk us through the test and the and the strangeness that is Eddie Jordan <laughs> I, I know Eddie for many years. I I, I did uh, some testing in his F3000 cars, I think in '84, somewhere around there. And Eddie and I get on well. I mean, he, he is a strange fellow, but if you understand him, uh, yeah, he's he's pretty cool. A lot of people wouldn't agree with me, but that's that's what it is. And uh, yeah, I. I bumped into him at Lamar the two years prior to the test and I started speaking to him and I knew about the Cecil deal and hoping that uh, that might convince him, which it did and, and he, he gave me a test and within that discussion was the Grand Prix seat. Unfortunately, Eddie, Eddie Irvine was also pretty hot on, on the seat side of things and you know yeah the, the test went went pretty well I, I was I was very happy with that and the engineers were happy with it but unfortunately it gets back to you know being South African traveling the world it, it, it's it, it wasn't easy then and and we didn't you know and I mean that that was it's not my excuse it's the excuse that people were using within the industry which mm -hmm. I understood 
you know, to, to go and do 18 Grand Prix or 16 Grand Prix, whatever it was then, throughout the world, there was a pretty good chance I'd miss one or two because of yeah. Yeah. my relation, relationship to the country. So, yeah, That's but yeah, amazing. it test went well, you know. Amazing how politics ends up, in, and not just country politics, uh, people politics ends up in, in racing. It's not just about the skill but politics and, and budget as well. George, jumping forward, our guys are telling us um, time is uh, of the essence. Jumping forward to today, you, um, you run a company, Dermalamp Phototherapy uh, for psoriasis. Yeah. Have I, did, have, did I pronounce it That's right? That's <laughs> And how did that come yes, about? Yes, uh, Vitaligo. Uh, well, I, I, I used to suffer from psoriasis, and uh, I was a guinea pig to to this, it, what it is, it's, it, it's light therapy, which we manufacture, and uh, well, it, it worked for me after struggling for 17 years with creams and dermatologists, and and yeah, that's something I took on after my racing career, and we work a lot with dermatologists and their, their patients, and direct to the public as well via, via their doctors. And yeah, it works for psoriasis, uh, eczema, vitiligo, dermavitis. Uh, it's uh, and it, it keeps me out of trouble. Keeps me well, it's <laughs> Always important to uh, um, to to keep out of trouble. George, we've got just before we go, we've got a couple of pictures that um, our guys. I, when I, I looked through some of these pictures, found them hell of interesting. Talk us through, uh, Fritz is going to put them up on the, the screen. Just talk us through, very briefly, um, your comments on some of the pictures. Have you got that one with the Alpha and Abel and uh, I think it's, um, is Abel Dolivera, Mick Formato, you, there you go, it's, um, Nicola Bianco. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Arnold Chats. That Arnold was a, Chats. That was a three-liter GTV. That was an awesome car. The memories of that car at, at Kyle Army. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that picture was taken, and that probably was the first one that came out. Um, yeah, not much I can say. I can't, I can't remember. You Don't know, worry. I, I was a bit of a wild... I was a bit of a wild bastard then. So <laughs> <laughs> I probably I bent up a few panels on that car. So so they say. Right, let's go through. Yeah, Pretty so if you say. can cycle through quickly. Opel Cadet, you Group One, a uh, Group N. Um, yeah, C, yeah. C forty was a great car. There you go. There you some bending some panels in your Pretoria brick. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Alpha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a lovely car that. Hey? That was a two and a half liter one. Yeah, that was. You had a good relationship uh, with uh, correct, Dar yeah. Darby De Villiers from Glenwood. Yeah, yeah, Darby. You know, he, he's he's a great guy, and uh, yeah, he's still still around playing with these Alfa Romeos. Yeah, at uh, Swart Corps. and then modified cadets. I think that's Pitt with you there in the, in the photograph there. That's that that's that is Pitt. Yeah, I think it looks like Cape Town. Um, Opel cadets. There's a story of. One race where a lone Golf GT uh, Golf GTR had a lacquer race against you and Tony Martin, but we won't go there. Next one, I... <laughs> another Porsche. Yeah, Kramer. Uh, somewhere Kramer. in Japan. There's your. That's uh, the Toyota. Toyota, yeah, lovely cars, and I mean the downforce on those cars, proper ground effects, must have been fun. Eh? Yeah. No. Uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, ground effect cars were uh, an error by themselves. There, that is probably my f absolute favorite car, your first Japanese car. Do you got fond memories of that car, George? I do, you know, Japan, Japan is a funny place, you know, it's, it's a different world to live in. But, you know, after, after staying there for two years, you start falling in love with it. And, and now, I mean, it's just... It's a wonderful place. The culture is fantastic. The, the discipline, you know, everything works there. The trains, you, you, you can, if you, if you need to set your watch, use a train because they, they stop at 
per second and they leave at the second. You know, if the if the train's going to leave at 20, 21 minutes past one and fifteen seconds, that's when it leaves. Uh, what was and your of course bullet trains? I mean, they 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 up yeah. to five hundred kilometers an hour. These these trains now. So that they, they, I mean, my day they were only up to three hundred and twenty kilometers now. So they were pretty pretty uh, awesome racing that, around Japan in a bullet train. That photograph should never have made it. Um, right? No, that one, number seven. No, that's Sorrel. Uh, there was a our research department sent the the wrong pictures. But they, but they was good. There was good memories of that uh, crash of Sorrel and Ian. Yeah, you and Sorrel have uh, have a special relationship as well, don't you? We've had some fun times, <laughs> which uh, we won't discuss on in a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moving swiftly along, <laughs> Georgie, you, what, what, what's the the short? Well, we know what the next couple of days future is going to be like for everybody. We we're all in this this thing together. Um, on the on the horizon, when we get out of house arrest, what is the next uh, the next couple of phases hold for George for sure? Have you thought of going back to to run in some some fun races in South Africa? Uh, well, the first thing we're going to do is go to the bowl store, I reckon. <laughs> uh, from a racing point of view, I I have I have no plans. I. I I quite enjoy watching. I quite enjoy the the, the endurance series. So, yeah, um, that that might be a possibility uh, if I if I could find a, a decent budget and put a team together. Uh, but you know, just sitting on the sideline, talking to old friends, having good times. That's that that entertains me enough now. Uh, from a driving point of view. Uh, I think I'm over that, but uh, that's that's speaking for now. You know, you know, in six months' time, I might might get itchy again and, and see what happens. So I, I don't know. I, as I say, life is too short to to worry about. You know, we have to have fun, and whatever the body says, that's what we must go and do. So if I wake up one morning and, and keen, well, great. Well, I tell you what, George. It's um, we could. I could sit and talk. The only thing better than sitting talking to you via um, like a sort of a virtual meeting is sitting around a table at, say, Swart Corps with a, a little cool drink in our hands and and remembering some of the crazy, crazy, crazy things. I remember a trip back from Joburg in an XR8, uh, but we won't go there. <laughs> George. <laughs> George Fisher, sports car legend, a proper, proper <laughs> racing hero, a man who's, you gave me a lot of entertainment, you've given me a lot of memories, you've, you've added to my life, George, and I'm sure that you've added to many, many South Africans. You're a true South African hero, a legend, and I just want to thank you for, for joining us uh, today and having a very, very short, brief chat about uh, some of your, the highlights of your life. George, thank you so much for joining us. Colin, you guys, welcome, and uh, thanks for having me, and uh, keep safe, don't get up to too much mischief, and we'll catch you later. We certainly will, George Fisher, unbelievable chatting to him, and that's it for this special broadcast of Raceday.tv, got to say a couple of thanks, thank you very much to the kind folk at uh, Vatswaye, who, they trade in classics. They trade, they, they love them, they look after them, and each of the cars tell a story. And it comes out of their love of, of, of classic cars, of cars that have got some mileage on them, um, with some history and a story to tell, that brought us to bring out some of the South African drivers who also have a story and some history to tell. We have a list of drivers that we would like to talk to, let us know who you would think that you really would like us to hook up. We've um, got some legends, true legends uh, on our list. But, so thank you very much for uh, the guys at Vatswaye, um, for Mot at Motorsport Technique for the Sparco Wear, um, and to Fritz and to Henk for driving the show and putting this show together. And lastly, for, to you for watching. Thank you very, very much. Uh, join us. I don't know when, but soon on raceday.tv as we bring you another look 
and another superstar legend of South African motorsport. For now, be safe, be lekker, cheers.